you're about to see Earth as you've never seen it before. Superman had X-ray eyes. So we see the planet as it couldn't be seen any other way. Right now, an army of sensors located underground, in the sky, the ocean, and even in our cities, are monitoring Earth. These cameras are out there in these most abject conditions, and they just sit there. And their little eyes are working for you. And they're seeing the hidden realms of the planet. What we're doing is a little bit like a CAT scan for the planet. Scanning the planet, we're seeing an Earth that seems to be alive. It's very easy to think of this as just a great big organism that's pulsing away just like I am. This is Earth as you've never experienced it. An X-ray vision that reveals the secrets of the planet. Every so often, Earth reminds us it's got a mind of its own. For thousands of years, we thought these events were bolts from the blue. But now we know that just as a cough is a symptom of something larger going on inside the human body, volcanoes, hurricanes, and even things like disease and pollution are evidence of something bigger going on within the body of Earth. So how do we know this? Remote cameras stationed near glaciers are monitoring the slow motion effects of a warming planet. We've parked sensors on the sea floor to discover the secrets of the deep. We're imaging it in the atmosphere and charting the lifelike rhythms of cities. And we're even using technology to decipher nature's code, which has revealed stunning insights into the planet and even us. Today, there's little about Earth that we aren't tracking. And all this probing is rewriting what we know about this pulsing world. Just look at what cutting-edge tech has shown us about the 99% of the planet we can't see. The hot insides of Earth. Here in the plains of South Dakota, researchers with Earthscope are deploying a sensor network that's literally bringing Earth's inside into view. It's called the U.S. Array. The U.S. Array is a large grid of 450 seismometers that's slowly leapfrogging its way across the country in a grid of about 70 kilometer spacing. and we'll be headed towards the East Coast over the next few years. Now just halfway across the United States, the network uses seismometers to detect earthquakes all over the world. These types of seismometers are so sensitive that we can record earthquakes from far away, earthquakes that go through all different types of rock. These seismometers contain motion detectors that can sense quakes on the other side of the planet that are so small, they can't be felt where they actually happen. This is the seismometer. It's the instrument that will actually sense the motion of the Earth. This is the device that sends all of the data over the Internet. These are the final connections to bring the station online. Once online, these devices stream data about quakes all over the world. But more importantly, they give scientists the data they need to see what's inside Earth. We collect data, like the amount of time it takes for earthquakes to arrive at all these different stations. 
Earth and we put it into our computers and we can calculate these big 3D models. Those big 3D models are pictures of the Earth's interior. It's a process called seismic tomography. Seismic tomography is a little bit like a CAT scan for the planet. So if you hurt your knee and you go in for a CAT scan, they're taking a 3D image of your knee. For the planet, what we're doing is creating 3D images of how fast those seismic waves travel through the Earth. A quake on the other side of the world sends waves coursing through the planet. With a network, researchers can not only see where the quakes occurred, but also the massive formations underground those waves traveled through. And that lets them create a picture of what lies beneath our feet. But to see what's going on, researchers need data. Lots of data. And that's why the U.S. array is so important. Because these stations are networked, it turns the entire continental United States into a unified sensor. It's the sheer size of the U.S. array that gives scientists eyes sensitive enough to see inside Earth. 5,150 kilometers beneath the surface is the solid inner core. Long a mystery, tomography's shown us the core's a sphere of crystallized iron, whose surface is studded with mountains. New seismic imaging also suggests the inner core may be spinning faster than the rest of the planet. That's because it's suspended in an ocean of hot liquid metal. 2,900 kilometers down, the outer core harbors enormous currents of iron and nickel. Atop this metallic ocean, tomography showing us mountain ranges on the underside of huge rock piles called anti-continents. Scientists believe these piles of stone exist in the most unlikely place, at the bottom of an enormous zone of hot plasticized rock called the mantle. Tomography indicates they funnel plumes of superheated rock up through the mantle, where they push into the thin shell of rock at the surface, called the crust. The crust is broken into pieces called plates. Moved by the churning mantle rock, those plates rub and bump into one another to produce thousands of quakes every single day. We always thought about the planet as being these onion shells of layers that don't play with each other. But what we're learning is that you can't take one without knowing about the other. And to better understand that, we need to know what's going on down there. But how do you explore a place you can't actually visit? Some researchers have solved that problem by taking that seismic data and turning it into something like a video game. So if we rotate underneath, we can see all of these earthquakes happening beneath the surface underneath Alaska now. Geophysicist Magali Belen is using a revolutionary new tool that turns seismic data into this, an immersive 3D experience. It's called the Center for Active Visualization in Earth Sciences, or CAVE for short. So um, working in the CAVE is actually a lot of fun. You just sort of jump in and start looking at it, figuring out what's there. Based at the University of California, Davis, the CAVE uses projectors, sophisticated software, and a lot of computing power to render this incredible view. Using something like a Wii handset, Belen has total control. She can make Earth bigger, smaller, and even step inside of it. The biggest advantage of using the cave is that it allows you to see things or find things that you didn't know to look for. Using this tool, she can see features that wouldn't be visible any other way, and even glean insights into how they work. 
This tool allows us to actually basically get inside of our data. We actually get to go inside the Earth as if we were there. What this kind of imaging reveals is the connection events on the surface have with features deep inside Earth. We see that the Icelandic volcano that shut down most of Europe in 2010 was just the tip of an enormous system. Under Africa, there's a plume boiling up that may be what's shearing the continent in half. And halfway around the world, we can see Hawaii's enormous volcanoes are being fed by a plume rising from an anti-continent down near the hot liquid core. Earthquakes are just one part of it. Volcanoes are another part of it. Uplift of giant mountain ranges are another part. So that's all driven by motion inside the Earth. Wiring the world with sensors and using innovative new technologies has given science its first look at the system at work beneath the surface. But what about the system at work above it? Way above it. If today's technology allows us to see the beating heart of Earth, can we also use it to see its lungs? Pakistan, August 2010. Epic floods leave millions homeless. At the same time in Russia, a heat wave sparks fires that scorch thousands of square miles. And in China, fierce storms trigger landslides that kill hundreds. The atmosphere can mete out some serious punishment. But is it possible these events are related? Some scientists believe it's proof of a changing climate. But what do our sensing technologies tell us? Researchers at NOAA's Global Monitoring Division are using some very sophisticated hardware to solve the mystery. We like to look upon our job here as being a hospital that's looking at the Earth. And we measure the heart rate the blood composition, and then we look at how this is changing over time. Like the inside of the planet, the atmosphere has layers. And though they extend out hundreds of miles, most of the atmosphere is concentrated down at the bottom. It's hard to believe, but if you fly in an aircraft at 30,000 feet, 90% of all the world's air is beneath you. To examine the atmosphere, NOAA researchers play doctor. Just as a physician draws blood to diagnose a patient, researchers here take air samples. They come from the Mongolian desert, from Kazakhstan, from Siberia, from England, from a little island in the Antarctic. We collect them wherever we can, and we can get a reliable sample that represents a fairly, fairly large part of the atmosphere in that area. These samples arrived in sealed bottles that are analyzed with spectrometers that count the molecules of individual gases. That data is then fed into computers to create models. And from those models, we can see the atmosphere as it's never been seen before. Superman had x-ray eyes. He could look at something you couldn't see with a normal set of eyes. So when we look at more carbon dioxide in the air, by color coding it, we see the planet as it couldn't be seen any other way. CO2 data from those samples are now seen as swirling clouds of red. And with this, we see something incredible. Earth breathing. And the red is showing us that during winter, there's actually an excess of carbon dioxide. And that's because 
all the plants and the leaves have fallen and they're decaying and they're releasing carbon dioxide into the air. And as time goes on, and now we're in summer, and when we look at the blue, we're really seeing that the leaves have pulled so much carbon dioxide out of the air in the northern hemisphere that turned it blue. But what this global sampling is showing us is that every year, Earth's breath is growing more and more shallow. So what you see here is plumes of high CO2 that come up from the land because of respiration. And this is that same picture now, but for 30 years, where we see that CO2 increases all over the Earth. Every single year, CO2 increases. Since 1990, the amount of CO2 has grown by about 8%. Doesn't sound like much. But because of it, we can see Earth is getting warmer. Here we're looking at global temperature change. The mid-1940s, the planet is still pretty cool. And what we see as we get into the century that we're in now, we see it beginning to warm a lot. From a cool blue to a red-hot planet, that extra heat, which amounts to less than two degrees Fahrenheit, is changing how this vast system behaves. We're changing the physics of the atmosphere. You change the physics of the atmosphere, there's going to be consequences. And those consequences are floods, heat waves, and increasingly savage storms. But since this weather is driven by tiny changes in chemistry, how do we study them? Sometimes you have to trek into the belly of a beast to find out. We've lost contact with Teal 76. Oh God, we're going to dock on too. It's the dawn of the Atlantic hurricane season, and a crew from the Air Force Reserve's Weather Reconnaissance Squadron is flying into a monster a 400-mile-wide tempest named Earl. There's going to be some fairly intense weather out there, and, and we're going to essentially drive through most of it straight through the center and into the eye of the storm. With winds of 135 miles an hour, Earl is churning in the Atlantic 350 miles east of Savannah, Georgia, and threatening the east coast. Since its birth, satellites have been monitoring Earl. Onboard infrared cameras have been tracking temperatures in the storm. Other satellites beam down radar to create these 3D images of the storm, which reveal its inner structure. But for all their power, there's one critical piece of data these satellites can't collect. Sometimes you have to go in and take a look at what's really going on. And the one thing that satellite imagery still doesn't do that we do is measure pressure. That's really the lifeblood of a hurricane. To determine pressure, they'll fly into the storm and drop sophisticated remote sensors called SONs from the plane. Inside these cylinders, a GPS locator measures winds. Another sensor tracks heat. And most importantly, a barometer records air pressure. Once ejected, a small parachute opens to stabilize the descent. Every half second, the sonde relays measurements back to the plane. Okay, guys, we're in. Bam, let's watch the chatter. Okay, five miles to go. And north of 90 knots on this northeast side already. Here we go. It's going to get rough here right about now. Three miles to go. One mile to the eye. And we're in it. It is nasty down below. Holy cow. I 
think that's pushing 70 knots. Maybe more. You don't want to be down there. Inside the eye, the crew drops a sod. And the data starts streaming back. We got 9.3. My first look at that sod. Sounds right. The numbers reveal Earl is starting to lose some of its punch. Pressure inside is rising, and the eye is beginning to fall apart. It's not a real nice concentric eye like we thought it would be. They'd be getting elongated, whatever. It's, it's not open at the top. I think what we're figuring out is this thing is a little more disorganized and a little less uh, strong than we thought it would be. Get a little farther north, maybe the water temperature's a little lower, so it's losing its energy. You can see the surface right there. As it sort of trucks north here, the water gets cooler and cooler. I think that is a recipe for this thing to continue to weaken. While data from the heart of a hurricane helps forecasters say whether they're going to hit land and how hard, it's also helping science understand how the atmosphere as a system is responding to those subtle changes in chemistry. Combining that data with information coming from satellites, we can see a disturbing trend in the behavior of these cyclonic storms. Looking at data collected over the last decade, we can see that hurricane intensity is increasing. Following the tracks of storms, we can see that trend as moderate storms. Seen here in blue are replaced by ever-growing numbers of severe storms, seen here in red. We have more and more sophisticated satellites we have faster computers and better models, and they allow us to look at the atmosphere. So we're learning a lot of our changing planet. Whether we're flying through hurricanes or imaging invisible gases, our ability to observe the atmosphere is revealing incredible insights about how Earth works. The atmosphere is a system that wields an incredible power over Earth. But what does all this technology reveal about life? Can it tell us more about how life fits into the anatomy of Earth? For most of us, what makes Earth special is life. Planet teems with it. From the highest mountains to the depths of the ocean, there seems to be no place life hasn't found a home. But what is our technology telling us about Earth's most unique feature? You got those clippers on you? That's one of the questions oceanographer Jack Barth is exploring off the windswept coast of Oregon. Barth is here trying to solve a marine mystery. What's killing a growing 6,400 square mile stretch of ocean? This piece of the ocean is called the Hecata Bank, as this is where the lowest oxygens are found up along the Oregon coast. So this, when oxygens go low enough and the creatures can't get enough oxygen out of the water, this is when they flee in the so-called dead zone. Dead zones are oceanic wastelands. Nearly devoid of oxygen, they drive organisms out and suffocate those too slow to flee. As you go into one of these low oxygen zones or dead zones, you see dead animals, fish dead, being blown around in the currents. You see carcasses of crabs. These are the Dungeness crabs that are piled up on the sea floor. Do one from the frame to this side. Using sophisticated sensing technologies, 
Barth believes he's ID'd the culprit. It's an organism that's too small to be seen with the naked eye, yet exemplifies the incredibly powerful role life plays on Earth. Life is to this planet as the blood is to the human body. It gives Earth its oxygen, cleanses the air of CO2, keeps the oceans from turning into acid, and acts as a thermostat by balancing the ratio of gases in the atmosphere. Understanding life is a critical system. You quickly see that some species carry more weight than others. Our species make up just two-tenths of one percent of life's total weight. Amazingly, in terms of sheer weight, there are as many ants as there are of us. Tiny Antarctic krill outweigh us by a factor of 13. Plants by a factor of 3,800 to 1. But even these numbers pale in comparison to the invisible microbes and bacteria that may make up as much as 80% of life's total weight. These unseen creatures are everywhere. Just the microbes living inside the human body add on average three pounds to a person's weight. In fact, there is so much microscopic life on the planet, it's estimated that if you took it all and laid it on the surface, it would cover Earth to a depth of five feet. Good look. Yeah. It's one of these microbes that Barth believes might be what's responsible for this stretch of dying ocean. It's a plant-like organism called phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is primary producers, or the base of the food web. Phytoplankton are one of the most important species on the planet. These plant-like creatures absorb billions of tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and produce more than half of the world's oxygen. Every year, they explode in bloom so large, we can see them from space fanning out across the sea. But ironically, it's this explosion of life that Barth believes is killing this stretch of ocean. When you get that bloom, it's a great thing. On the other hand, when that plankton die off and they fall to the bottom, that's an organic mass of material that can then be decayed and pull the oxygen out of the water. And every year, those blooms are getting bigger. But why? To find out what's going on at the bottom of the sea, Barth is deploying a sensor array that can do for the ocean what a CAT scan does for a patient. What's important about the sensors we have out here is we're linking together the physics, the temperature, salinity, and the currents with the ecosystem response. The network is really a collection of many different sensors that stream data on everything from the chemistry of the ocean to what's living there. So this is our main submersible instrument package. One of our main instruments here it pulls water from the ocean, measuring the temperature and the salinity. Then that water passes down into this next instrument, and it's measuring the dissolved oxygen. The next thing that's in line here is this black tube on top here, and it's actually using light to detect the chlorophyll content in the water. Barth and his team are deploying one of these sensors to the sea floor to sniff out clues as to why these blooms are getting bigger. Let's go, Kim. All right, we're gonna put them in there. Everybody clear? All right. 10.30. Once moored to the sea floor, the sensor begins its continuous scan of the deep that Barth can monitor in real time and even control. We've got this sensor. It sends the data to the surface and sends it back to shore on a cell phone. And I can actually, on my computer, not only get that data, but I can talk back to it and say, 
Something's funny happening now. Let's measure twice as fast. Control like that is critical because dead zones are a growing malignancy in Earth's oceans. Where once they numbered just a few dozen, there are now more than 400 dead zones snaking their way around coastlines across the globe. Colored yellow and red for the most severely affected areas, we see them in Asia, off the coast of Japan and China, in Australia, and along the coastlines of North America. It really is a change sweeping through the marine ecosystem here. Sometimes we use that forest fire analogy where it sweeps through an area and then you've got to rebuild that, uh, that marine community. Using this sensor, Barth has discovered that currents of water moving from the deep ocean are growing larger. Called upwelling, these currents drag nutrients up from the sea floor. It's just like fertilizing your garden in the spring. Wham, you get a bloom of plankton. Now, on the other hand, that same material, as it dies off and sinks to the bottom, that's the organic material that can decay and then rob the oxygen from the lower layers. So if it's the blooms that deplete the oxygen and the deep water nutrients that feed the blooms, what's powering the increased upwelling? In our system, the winds are very important to drive that upwelling. And if the winds change, it affects the upwelling in those lower layers. Winds move warm surface waters out to sea. And cold water from the bottom moves in to fill the space. So what's changing the winds? Now, global warming can change the winds. We're seeing that on the planet where wind patterns change, wind intensities change likely heard about hurricane intensity. So that's the change in the atmosphere. So here on the Oregon coast, we're receiving these lower oxygen deep waters, and the winds seem to be changing. And those two together are shaping how that oxygen zone plays out. Bar sensors are revealing the complex relationship life, the atmosphere, and ocean share, and illustrates the transformative power life wields over the planet. So we've never really had this information before. So we can now look at the ocean environment just like we do land environments and see how things are changing over time. Life wields an enormous power over Earth. For billions of years, it's been at work modifying and manipulating the planet. But when we take a closer look at how life can change Earth and the sometimes unintended consequences that go with it, we need to crawl out from the oceans to look at another species altogether. We need to turn those sensors on ourselves. What keeps Earth looking, smelling, and feeling like Earth is the complex interplay of the systems at work. Within each are billions of parts that work together to sustain this living planet. But what happens when one of those parts starts doing something different? Of the billions of species that have existed over the past three and a half billion years, Nuns change the planet faster or more dramatically than humans. We move more sediment every year than all the rivers on Earth. We've ground away mountains and turned forests into plains and built cities so large they create their own climates. We've also changed the chemistry of the atmosphere and even turned up the heat in the oceans. Some believe a new age in Earth history has dawned. The Anthropocene, the age of humans. So what does this new age mean to a living world? In the realm of ice and snow, the effects look something like a fever. Yeah, this is a lot more ice in the water than it was the last time I was here. Like, the, the chunks are bigger and there's a yeah, lot definitely. more volume. At the foot of Alaska's Mendenhall Glacier, 
Photographer James Baylog has turned his cameras into sensors to capture some of the most stunning visual data of an Earth in flux. These cameras are like my little pet robots. Uh, we set them up on these cliffs, and they're out there in these most abject conditions, and they just sit there, and their little eyes are working for you. The work these little eyes do is take pictures, one an hour, for years at a time. It's called the Extreme Ice Survey. Well, this is as pretty as it gets. EIS is a combination of art and science. I felt that there was an historical moment, there was a record that should be created, a voice for the landscape that could be projected out through these pictures, and I decided to do this project. Baylogs installed cameras at 22 sites around the world. Powered by solar panels, the cameras are shielded from the glacial extremes by a thick plastic housing. Some of the, the cameras are exposed to minus 30, minus 40 degree Fahrenheit. We have winds that are uh, constantly in excess of 100 miles an hour in certain locations. You know, this is, this is pretty rough going for this equipment. But what they've managed to capture is some of the most dramatic imagery of what happens when Earth runs a fever. Climate change is kind of an abstraction to most people. But in these glaciers, it's a tangible thing where you can see these processes of massive change on the Earth happening right in front of your eyes. When I put those cameras up, this was all covered in ice in here. It's amazing how much it was changes. covered in ice all the way over there. My God, crazy, 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 crazy. Bay logs come to Mendenhall Glacier to retrieve data from three months of camera observation. Okay, now let's have a look. There it is. There's pictures. What his cameras revealed is a glacier in a near constant state of motion, breaking away, retreating, and flooding the lake with icebergs. God, look at that. There's a lot more ice out there a little while ago. Mendenhall has been this amazing re revelation for me. When we first put the cameras out, the glacier extended all the way across this lake. That was three years and three months ago. It's gone back about 200 feet per year. Nice, good stuff. It's like the difference in how much you retreated. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Just a few months. And it's not just this Alaskan glacier. It's ice all over the world. Glaciers all around the world are retreating dramatically. What's going on now in ice fields like this one in Alaska is something that's happened many times before. Earth's climate history is like a roller coaster. There were times when Earth was warmer and crocodiles basked on the shores of polar lakes. At other times, Earth was cooler and ice sheets a mile thick covered vast areas of the planet. But in the past, this ebb and flow was tied to things like changes in Earth's alignment and massive volcanic eruptions. Today, those changes are being forced by humans. This is not natural variation. We are way beyond the realm of natural variation right now. It's very, very clear that these changes are taking place because of human impact on the environment. This is about fossil fuel burning. It's about us treating the atmosphere, the air around us, as a free garbage dump. Well, there we go. We got it. Cool. <sighs> Looks good. Okay, good to go. Yep. Despite their enormous size, glaciers like Mendenhall react reflexively to even the most modest shifts in temperature. You know, a lot of these different glaciers in different parts of the world are like different animals, different animal species. They respond differently to different characteristics in the habitat around them. So what we've been able to create is a sense of individual dynamics in these glaciers that people have been using to understand how the glaciers respond to climate. 
What Baylog sensors have managed to record is how individual glaciers around the world respond to that change. We have this one glacier called Rink Glacier. The temperature never goes above minus 25 for months at a time, and yet this thing is alive. And these giant ice islands break off and they spin around in the fjord out in front of it and then somehow plow their way out through a frozen sea and out they go. We have a glacier in Greenland, the Alulasat Glacier, that's moving 125 feet a day. That's a fantastic speed. And it's flushing 15 billion tons of ice into the ocean every year. I mean, it's like mind boggling. All right. For science, these images are priceless because it's information that can be cross-referenced with other data to better understand changes going on all over the world. The scientists are taking these pictures and connecting the imagery to the climate, the warming, the daily variation in temperatures. All of that is tied to glacier behavior. A lot of things come together in these pictures and different researchers are using them in different ways to tease out different parts of the story. Combining data like Baylogs with those scientists are collecting from the atmosphere and the bottom of the ocean provides us with an x-ray of this organism we call Earth. But can we go even deeper? Just as scientists use lab rats to learn more about human responses, can we do something similar with Earth? Breakthroughs in technology are giving science its first look at the systems shaping Earth from above and below. But the sheer size of this living world makes it impossible for any one technology to reveal Earth's complex orchestration. But that's not keeping science from trying. One group sidestepping the problem by taking the planet, shrinking it down, and putting it under glass. It's called Biosphere 2. The Biosphere 2 apparatus is a grand experiment in trying to understand how the Earth works, how different components of the Earth system all interact, and how they change and feedback on each other through time. Housed within a skin of glass, biosphere is divvied up into four different natural environments, or biomes. There's a desert, a savanna, an ocean, and a rainforest, built in an area big enough to park a fleet of jetliners. Under this geodesic sky, researchers can turn the dials inside this mini Earth to do things like crank up the temperature and change the chemistry of the air. The entire facility is an apparatus that allows us to ask questions in a very sophisticated way. The building itself is a tool for doing science. And to do that science, they rely on the infrastructure snaking beneath this miniature Earth. It's an area these researchers call the technosphere. This leads to the bottom. The technosphere is where all the electrical, the plumbing, and the mechanical systems reside that make it possible for us to create our climate inside this mini world. There are enormous ducts to cycle the air, pipes that feed biosphere's artificial rains, and giant humidifiers to control moisture in its synthetic atmosphere. You gotta get these all snug, so if you do fall, they're not gonna slide. It'll catch you really smoothly. It's this marriage of nature and technology that gives researchers the power to do things like take the rain out of a rainforest. An experiment that we could do here that is very difficult to do in the natural world is we can subject this entire forest to drought. They've turned up the temperatures and turned off the taps to see how this forest responds. 
the reason that we have these sensors set up all along these towers in several locations in the rainforest is to see how the forest responds to these new variables. The sensing technology at work within this environment measures everything from photosynthesis to light penetration to changes in biosphere's atmospheric chemistry. You can get information about whole forest responses by measuring things like change in carbon uptake and respiration by trees. Rainforests are a critical piece of Earth engineering that impacts everything from atmospheric chemistry to temperatures, to weather patterns, and even life. Not only are they home to more than half the world's species, they absorb billions of tons of carbon dioxide and create nearly a quarter of the world's oxygen. Yet these primeval forests are disappearing. 10,000 years ago, forests covered nearly 20 million square miles of the planet. But as we see, those forests are shrinking. In Siberia, Asia, Indonesia, Africa, and the Americas, forests are withering away. 80% of them are gone, and what forests remain look like islands in a sea of bare earth. From space, we can see the process, the steady retreat, as those forests are cut to make way for roads, ranches, and farms. Now those remaining forests are being threatened by climate, but no one knows exactly how they're responding. Which is what these researchers are trying to find out. Yeah, so just like the real rainforest, you kind of got to battle your way through branches to get where you want to get to. It can be a little tricky. What they're learning is that in the absence of rain, virtually everything about the forest starts to change. Originally, there were about 370 species. Now we're down to about 92. So that begs the obvious question, what characteristics allows these plants that are still here to continue existing? In an actual rainforest, answering that question would be too difficult. But here, the ability to control the environment is what makes biosphere such an incredible tool. It gives scientists a way to test and then take those results and compare them to what's going on in the real world. The power of Biosphere 2 comes from taking very complex systems, a tropical forest, and creating a model representation of a tropical forest to develop an understanding that we then can take back to the real world. Ever since those three astronauts aboard Apollo 8 brought Earth into focus, we've been using technology to poke and probe the planet. From the fiery depths of our world to the heart of its most savage storms to its fields of moving ice, Technology is revealing the planet as it truly is. A living, breathing, pulsing world. But can those technologies take us even deeper? Can we use them to decipher nature's code? And for the first time ever, read the blueprints for the planet and everything on it. In a world wired with sensors, we're seeing a planet very different than the one we thought we knew. Instead of the inert sphere of rock hurtling through space, we're learning Earth works more like a living being.
But can those same sensors be used to learn something even more profound about the planet? Could we use them to actually read nature's blueprints? On the surface, the natural world appears random, frenzied and chaotic. But look closer, and you'll see there are patterns. From the petals on a flower, to the meandering track of a river. There's a geometry in the world around us. That geometry is called fractal. A fractal is a shape that's repeated at different scales. So that if you're looking at one part of the fractal, you're also seeing the whole. So what kind of insight do fractals give us into this living world? Don't step in the plot. It's very easy to trample this vegetation. Here in the Colorado backcountry, biologist Brian Enquist is using fractals to better understand how Earth breathes. We're using fractal geometry to help us understand and hopefully predict the total amount of carbon dioxide that comes in and out of the ecosystem, effectively how the Earth breathes. Enquist believes that by studying the geometry of individual plants, he can accurately gauge how much carbon dioxide is consumed by this environment. If you were to invent CO2 goggles and put them on, what you would see is photosynthesis and respiration in plumes and waves all across this valley. CO2 coming in, CO2 coming out. What Enquist is looking for is a pattern, a scaled relationship shared by a single plant or leaf in the environment it inhabits. Within nature, we can identify patterns. Those patterns then can be described mathematically. And that's actually very powerful, because then if we have a pattern, we can then use that to more accurately predict and understand nature. Nature may appear random, but there's an invisible order that can be seen with math. Take an X-ray of the human arm. It reveals a numeric design that's expressed throughout nature. One bone at the top connects to two bones in the forearm. Those connect to eight bones in the wrist, which feed to five bones in the hand and three bones in each of the fingers. These numbers, one, two, three, five, and eight, are part of a famous mathematical set called the Fibonacci sequence. It's a series of numbers where each is the sum of the two numbers preceding it. Take these numbers and plot them on a graph, and what emerges is a spiral, whose arcing curve matches the pattern of a pine cone. That's also the same curve we see in a nautilus shell. And that's important. A pattern is effectively the basis of how to do science. Scientists look for patterns in nature. And as biologists, we look for patterns in biology. Once we identify a pattern, that implies then potentially we can predict something about the world. But it doesn't stop there. Take any number in the Fibonacci sequence and divide it by the one preceding it, and you get a number approaching 1.618. It's a ratio commonly called the golden mean. Now look at that x-ray of the human arm. The difference in length between the forearm and the hand is equal to the golden mean. And it's the same for the three bones in the finger. It's even in our DNA. The length of one full revolution divided by the molecule's width falls close to this magic ratio. The Fibonacci sequence and the ratio it creates are examples of fractals. Just like the patterns of veins within a leaf, mirrors the branching pattern of the tree. A fractal is the same shape, just repeated at different scales. A fractal implies self-similarity. And a self-similar pattern, then, is a pattern that is repeatable and observable at multiple different scales of observation.
Nature relies on this geometry because fractals allow it to create vast structures in an amazingly efficient way. It's how it packs 60,000 miles worth of veins and arteries into a human being. And it's how nature bundles six foot long DNA strands into a tiny cell nucleus. In fact, if you took all the DNA inside a human and lined it up end to end, it would reach out past Pluto, four billion miles away. But fractals are at work in more than just organisms. They even permeate the environments those organisms inhabit. Look at an average tree in a forest. The number and size of its branches closely reflects the number and size of trees in that forest. If you look at an individual tree, and if you step back and if you look at, at an individual forest, what you'll actually find is a similar mathematical pattern. It's that pattern that Enquist is trying to discover because with it, he'll have the data to say how much CO2 moves through this environment by looking at a single plant or even a leaf. And so what's really cool is that if you actually look within that branching pattern that you see within a leaf, we can see within the branching pattern of an entire tree, and actually if you look at how plants pack into the natural world, it's actually quite similar. Be very gentle with this one. But finding that pattern takes work. A lot of painstaking work. If we have a closed, controlled little environment, we put our CO2 probe within the tent, and we can measure very quickly how fast then the plants scrub that miniature atmosphere of the CO2. Okay, so, then, so here, we're setting up the CO2 probe. Let's go ahead and lower the tent. Go. go. Chain off. So we're making a flux measurement right now. You can hear the little fans on the inside, and so we're mixing the air. These plants are scrubbing this little atmosphere of the CO2 that's inside the tent, and we can record how fast they're doing it. 448, 446. Wow, it's really dropping fast. 443. The plants actually took in about more than 10% of, of the carbon dioxide that was in that tent at the time. Yeah, great job, plants. <laughs> so we're gonna start chopping this one apart. Every plant that was in the tent is then carefully measured. 82.7. 82.7. Cut and bagged for transport back to the lab. 6.5. 6.5. In the laboratory, we take apart plants and we measure the nutrients in the plant. So if we know how much plant material is in one space and we can estimate how much plant material is at the larger scale, that's how we can actually link our measurement at a small size to the measurement of carbon dioxide at a large size. It's difficult work, but the end result will reveal the fractal architecture of this mountain meadow. When you clear a plot and pick out each of the individuals, what you'll actually find is a distribution of sizes. That is, there are going to be very few big individuals and a heck of a lot of small individuals. And what's absolutely fascinating is that pattern is a fractal pattern. As you zoom in, as you go from the landscape scale down to very small scales, at each of these different spatial scales, we see the same distribution of sizes. And that distribution of sizes is fractal or self-similar. If Enquist can scale up from a leaf to a meadow, who's to say he can't scale up from a meadow to the entire planet? Such a model would give us a global view of where CO2 is being absorbed by Earth's terrestrial plant life. That's the goal, and if he can do it, Enquist will have the tools to predict how Earth's atmosphere will react as environments are modified. We're about to see enormous amount of change that's going to be occurring within natural ecosystems, and so we want to know what's going to happen. And what we're trying to do is utilize these underlying mathematical truths about nature to try to help us predict what may happen in the future. The math of nature is giving science the language to understand our planet on a much deeper level. 
The ability to see nature's designs is giving science the tools to see how a living Earth works and even understand why. But what do these insights tell science about humans? Can the same math we see inside a tree be used to study society? And if so, what kind of story do they tell us about ourselves and our relationship with planet Earth? All around the planet, change is afoot. But what's behind it? Data coming from satellite and ground-based sensors provides an explanation. Here we can see how much of the Earth's surface has been changed by human development, ranging from moderate impact in light green to dense urbanization in red. There are few places on the planet that haven't been altered in some way by the human species. But of all those changes, few have had a greater impact than the modern metropolis. So what do these environments of concrete and steel mean to a living planet? Researchers are looking toward biology for an answer. Physicist Jeffrey West sees cities differently. It's very easy to think of this as just a great big organism that's pulsing away just like I am. These buildings are really, so to speak, the skeleton of the city. These streets, the people walking down the sidewalks, the cars moving through, are really the analog to our circuitry system. But do those similarities go even deeper? Do cities also work like biology? To find out, West and his team of researchers look at data from cities on everything from bank transactions to the length of electrical cables. You look at every possible metric or characteristic that has been measured uh, across multiple cities. In these numbers, West is looking for a pattern similar to the one that's universal in biology. Plot an animal's energy needs in relation to its weight, and an amazing pattern emerges. A mouse needs a lot of energy in relation to its size, has a fast heartbeat, but lives a brief life. An elephant is just the opposite. It needs less energy per pound, has a slow heartbeat, and lives a long life. Even more incredible is that all mammals scale at the same rate. Each mammal that has ever existed on this planet, no matter how small or how big or what color they are, we are each some scaled version of one single mammal. Is it possible that a similar scaling law could also apply to something non-biological? Like a city? It's quite fascinating what we found. Just as a blue whale is a scaled up version of an elephant, which is a scaled up version of a human being, it turns out that New York is indeed a scaled up version of San Francisco, which is a scaled up Boise, which is a scaled up Santa Fe. But there's an important exception. In nature, as an animal gets bigger, their energy needs per pound and pace of life slows down. The opposite is true of cities. The bigger they get, the more energy they need, and the faster everything moves. If you look at spread of disease, rate of transactions, all of these increase as the city gets bigger, even the pace of walking. The rate at which you walk amazingly increases systematically with city size. But what makes West's research so incredible is that all cities scale at the same rate. 
If you double a city size, what you discover is an extraordinarily simple rule that your wages will go up by about 15%, the number of police goes up by around 15%, the amount of crime goes up by 15%. There is this 15% rule that stretches across the whole spectrum of human activity. Is this scaling pattern proof that seemingly separate issues like crime and disease are in some way linked? Is there some kind of natural order at work inside these concrete environments? They seem to be extraordinarily interrelated and interconnected. All of these scale together with the same exponent. This cannot be an accident. And if it's not an accident, and there is a natural order, even in cities, can problems like global climate change and crime be somehow related? Just focusing on global warming, or understanding risk in the markets, or understanding problems of health and disease in Africa is dangerous. You need to have a much broader, integrated, holistic view. We need to understand how cities function to start to address these questions. The more we reveal about the hidden patterns and rhythms of a city, the better we can diagnose problems with the planet. But for most city dwellers, that's an abstraction. What they want to know is what living within one of these urban organisms means to their lives. And in Oakland, California, residents are using technology to find out. I'm gonna turn on my GPS system, turn my dust track two on, and then I'm gonna take off on my walk. A group of volunteer citizen scientists is using mobile sensing technology to get an incredibly detailed picture of the urban atmosphere. I think we all experience the environment as individuals, not as masses of people. So what we want to know is really what you're breathing and what I'm breathing. And that data is being collected by the residents themselves. There's a lot of health problems in my community, and I'd like to find out what's in the air and what my kids are breathing. All three of my children have asthma. These backpacks house sophisticated air sensors. Every second, it breathes in a puff of air and analyzes it for pollutants. At the same time, a GPS tracker marks the exact location where the sample was taken different upper respiratory disease and the cancers that we have in our neighborhood. We get a lot of community meet people that come out and volunteer. This is what helps them to get the data that they need. That data can then be used to create maps that reveal hidden dangers in the air. So this is our little walk around the neighborhood. And you can see that even in one circuit, it's not all the same. Green is good, yellow moderate, orange becomes unhealthy for sensitive groups, red gets pretty much generally unhealthy. Over here along the major commercial corridors where you might have trucks and buses passing through, levels are higher, it's all yellow. If this is consistent over a lifetime in the community, then this could be a significant health factor. Using miniaturized versions of this same technology, we may all one day help build maps that show how unhealthy air clusters in the places we live. I think what we're doing is a little microscopic version of what could be a global movement. If someday a parent trying to evaluate a daycare center can look at their smartphone on a Google map and say, oh, well, the daily air pollution levels here are pretty high. I don't think this is the place. Hyper-local data like this could change everything about how and where we live. From property values to public policy, data from the street has the potential to alter society and even the world. But what about the future? What new technologies will be used to detect change in neighborhoods? Well, Big Brother may be watching you, and that can save your life.
It's strange to believe that these islands of concrete and steel behave like living things. But what the latest data reveals is that if you double the size of a city, any city, you get an across-the-board increase in all the good and all the bad. That's their curse. But new sensing technologies are coming online. It may be able to diagnose the ills of urban growth while protecting and even nurturing the good. Add them to the dispatch. Richmond, California, a working class town tucked away on the northeast end of San Francisco Bay, has long had a reputation for urban scourges like poverty and crime. But within the city of 100,000, one of the roughest areas was the Easter Hill Housing Project. There was a time where the police officers were told not to enter Easter Hill alone. You had to go in with two cars in order to make sure you had sufficient coverage. But Easter Hills changed. It's now called Richmond Village, and it's got an incredible bit of engineering that's keeping the peace. It's a device that tells police when and where a gun is fired. Here, designers run a test. Mikhail, you ready for the test? Roger, test fire number one. Proceed with test fire number one when ready. The device uses sensitive microphones that pick up the sound of gunfire. The difference in time it takes for sound to reach each microphone allows the device to triangulate the location of the shot. At which point, a camera swings into action and starts recording. OK, did you get a gunshot? The location looks good. Mikhail, that last shot was 229 degrees and two degrees of elevation. Everything looks really good on this end. Nice work. Roger that. In Richmond Village, 16 of the crime prevention systems stand watch over the neighborhood. They're linked to an on-site command center monitored by police officers. They conduct periodic tests to ensure the system is always in working order. Charles 31, countdown please. Charles 31 copies. Three, two, one. Test confirmed. Copy, thank you. The system clearly works, but does it work to fight crime? Since 2006, when the system was installed, the police department has not had any responses to Richmond Village in regards to uh, gunshot violence or illegal gunshots. So is this a case of technology changing human behavior? The result in this neighborhood has been nothing short of a transformation. Since the sensors went up, crimes involving guns have plummeted. The neighborhood's changed and today looks more like a squeaky clean subdivision than the dilapidated warren of tenements it was just a few years ago. The system actually works very well as a, a deterrent for the criminals in terms of their normal behavior. They know that if you shoot, we will zoom in and we will get a face. Using technology to inoculate cities against the ill effects of growth is just one application of our advanced sensing capabilities. But what if we could wire cities to monitor everything, from pedestrian and car traffic to the health of buildings, roads, and bridges? That's what one Silicon Valley researcher is on the cusp of delivering. So, uh, Matt, are you ready? Yep. Okay, so go ahead and tap on the box. You good? Yeah, that's nice. 
we're working on a technology that we call Central Nervous System for the Earth, or SANS. Peter Hartwell is a scientist working at the farthest frontier of innovation. And his newest creation holds the potential to give cities, and even the planet, the ability to feel. Sense is really about um, bringing awareness to this brain that we like to think of the internet. The net already spans the globe, with links reaching across oceans and continents to connect people in places that had long been separated by geography. With this device, Hartwell could turn the internet into a giant sensor that would give us an unprecedented awareness of our cities and the planet. So we've taken this aerial photo of our campus, and the blue squares out here are where we put the sensor nodes. So from this map, we can click on a node, and for example, we can go to, to building two here, and then I can click on that node, and that will bring us up this uh, real-time data coming in, streaming in from the node. This large mass of nodes out there really becomes the senses on the end of our nervous system. What Hartwell sensors pick up are vibrations way too subtle to be felt by humans. Moving objects produce unique vibrations that Hartwell sensors can be trained to recognize. Those in turn can be used to see when the building's being used, and even if it's damaged. What we can look at is the plot of the, the vibration of the building. And what we'll be looking for is any shift in these peaks, which may indicate that the structure or the health of the building is changing. Whether you're talking about structural health monitoring, earthquake warning systems, security applications, water safety, innumerable things. We kind of came up there was almost the possibility of almost a trillion nodes that you could deploy as part of a worldwide central nervous system. So let's see if we can find a place uh, near the water pipe. All right. Yeah, let's set up over here. Yeah. Because they're small and send data wirelessly, the nodes can be placed anywhere to monitor virtually everything. Yeah, we got a good signal coming in. Fixed to bridges and buildings, they can detect structural deformations. In roads, they can monitor traffic. They could be used to sniff out poisons in the air and even tell you what your dog's doing when you're away. Hey, what was that? Oh, Moxie just came in through the dog door. He's a good girl. <laughs> it's a really small signal, but it definitely shows up clearly. <laughs> now envision a trillion nodes covering the planet. They could provide the bridge that allows our surroundings to communicate with us in real time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, nice big signal. All right, great. That could revolutionize human interaction with the Earth the same way the internet revolutionized interaction between people. Sense really gives you this awareness so that you can understand safety and the sustainability and security of you and your families and try to improve those by having the information to see how you're affecting the planet. It's really an awareness of the planet. Outfitting a city with ears that react to gunfire or giving Earth the ability to feel will no doubt give us insights into the planet that we've never had before. But what if you could learn the same things by turning an entire species into a sensor? Turns out, humans make the perfect detecting device. You just have to learn how to read the data coming in from the nearly 7 billion of us on the planet. When it comes to taking Earth online, researchers talk sensors. What's important about the sensors we have out here? Nodes. And the blue squares out here are where we put the sensor nodes. And networks. Because these stations are networked, it turns the entire continental United States into a unified sensor. In this age of Earth exploration, it's all about getting technology out into the world to build bigger networks of satellites seismometers, or submarine sensors. But could we take this even further and tap into an enormous network that's already in existence? Could we turn ourselves into sensors? We've now got the ability to get very detailed information about people. But it's not from the kinds of satellites that we fly 
It's from people themselves. The human species covers an enormous range. From the highest latitudes to the lowest, there's virtually no piece of dry land we don't inhabit. So what kind of information can we learn about Earth by looking at ourselves? Let's start by looking at where we live. Countries rise and fall based on the number of people living in them. But a different world emerges when we see where people are born. Looking at per capita data, we see even more. Here are death rates. And this is where people starve. So what do these maps tell us? We use demographic data to know where the people are, first and foremost. But also, we need to know some of the characteristics of those people. For example, we need to look at the fertility rates. How rapidly is the population changing? So we get into properties of people. Some researchers are using shifts in population, births, deaths, and rates of starvation to track changes on the planet. Shifts in atmospheric chemistry, for example, lead to changes in weather patterns, which can mean prolonged drought, less food, starvation, and death. Climate change is much faster, and arguably the human populations are more sensitive because there are so many of us. Starvation then also mirrors rates of disease, like tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria. Those too can be used to track climatic changes. As the planets warmed, researchers are now seeing malaria in places that were once cooler and therefore immune to the disease. Looking at a warming planet, we can change the data to see where greenhouse gases originate. We can even take that a step further to see how that tracks with modern day luxuries like cell phone use internet access, and even fast food. What this changing map reveals is just how far outside the natural bounds some researchers believe our society has evolved. 50,000 years ago or so, our metabolic rate was uh, two or 300 watts, in, in, even including our activity, and that was appropriate for our size, but now, we were using 11,000 watts. Eons ago, the human population took just 300 watts worth of energy from the planet in the form of food to survive. Now, we take on average 3,800 times more energy to do things like run our cars, power our homes, watch movies, and cruise the net. It illustrates the problem that we have created by being so successful as social animals and creating the extraordinary society that we have now with all the various artifacts and the wonderful things that we all enjoy. It's not surprising that with approaching seven billion people and with all that we're doing, that we're changing our atmosphere and we're changing it faster than it's changed probably in hundreds of thousands of years. It's a change that this planet hasn't seen and that we need to understand in order to prepare for. And that's what these maps help us do, prepare. With them, we see trends, identify problems, and reveal how we as a species live on and with Earth. Both the environment in which we live, the planet itself, and humanity determine our future. We live with that mixture all the time. We are both creatures of our site, where we are, and also of our situation, the context in which we live. These patterns show us that what we do on Earth Earth feels. Now it seems like the planet is pushing back. But can the same sensing technologies that are revealing Earth also show us how to live in harmony with it? 
The technology we've cast out into the world is giving us a never before seen look at Earth as a living organism. Yet for all the sensors we have out there, we're still just beginning to understand what makes this planet tick. So what's next? What future technology will come online to give us an even better understanding of this living world? That technology may already exist because that network is us. There are 117 people for every square mile of dry land on Earth. So how do we turn people into sensors and create the largest data gathering network on the planet? Well, there may soon be an app for that. There are nearly five billion cell phones in use around the world. That's five billion pocket-sized computers that could be used to turn the human species into a fully wired sensor. Cell phones already track our movements with GPS, monitor our communications, and even track our behavior. But could a phone be turned into something more? Some researchers are trying to get a cell phone to smell. Our idea is to basically incorporate pollution sensors in the mobile phones and other mobile devices. Embedded in a phone, the sensor could tell their owners what they're breathing. So this is the concentration of carbon monoxide in the chamber that this sensor is reading right now. Now envision a global network of cell phones doing the same thing and tracking everything from the weather to carbon dioxide to the spread of disease. You get millions of sensors in the environment, and you can get a much better picture of what the environment looks like. Sensor technology is all about resolution. The more sensors out in the world, the more detailed the picture. What they've already shown us is that we and everything else on Earth form a vast, interconnected system that's in a state of perpetual change and motion. Be it traffic moving into and out of the city, human movements across continents, or the communication networks that connect us all. We can plot the course of hurricanes, chart oceanic wastelands, monitor vanishing forests, and dissect our planet through the thousands of satellites speeding around it. With the moon and the path of planets, a universe of motion spans out from this little world we call Earth. But where does that leave us? As the modern age brings this living planet into focus, perhaps the most significant discovery of all is that we are the planet and the planet is us. That's why understanding this enormous organism we call home may be the most important thing we ever do. It's a complicated world, but I think we're onto something that is showing us how nature works. With advanced technologies, we now understand the same forces that brought forth our world are inseparable from ourselves. And those insights are allowing us to answer some of the most profound questions humankind has ever asked. We've learned an immense amount, but in the years since, we've built better and better networks. We have more and more sophisticated satellites. We basically have faster computers and better models, and they allow us to look at our changing planet. Though we may be changing the planet in ways it's never changed before, our ability to monitor our impacts give us, and Earth, something it's never had. An awareness. I think that the outlook is really good for the planet because I think that we've developed an almost unrecognized understanding of how amazing the complex system is understood. And that awareness 
may be what ensures that humanity isn't just one of Earth's failed experiments, but one of its most enduring triumphs.